Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. And I'm looking forward for this opportunity to share with you this passage and uh, sermon from Romans chapter seven. Our scripture begins at Romans chapter seven, verse 15, and says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin that's living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another work, law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that's at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your word and we pray that as we uh, ponder it and, and uh, consider it today, that you'll speak to us, give us wisdom and guidance and direction in all things. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. This passage from Romans chapter seven uh, talks about somebody that's conflicted, right? Uh, the good they wanna do uh, and the bad they end up doing and why can't they do what they wanna do? Why do they end up doing all the things they don't wanna do? Uh, it, it talks about somebody who's feeling some regret uh, over things that they've done. Uh, somebody who's looking back and saying, why did I do that? And you, and you can see the intent and the heart behind it that uh, Paul, the writer, is saying that I didn't mean to do bad. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. I didn't mean to uh, cause the problems that I did. It's only after everything happens and the dust settles that they realize how bad their actions are. And so I think this, this not only talks about Paul sort of as an uh, autobiography, but I also think that Paul is dealing with uh, caricatures of uh, society, of people in general. And so last week we talked about this idea of intersection between freedom and responsibility, and this is the second part of that. Uh, as we looked at what Paul is saying and kind of held that up against uh, the story of the prodigal son, 
uh, and how Jesus introduced those characters and how I think that those characters and the uh, unpacking of them is at the heart of a lot of what Paul is writing. And we're going to, we spent some time with that last week and we're going to look at that this week. Uh, and I think this is especially important for Paul because he's lived in both worlds. He's lived the first half of his life as kind of an older brother, law keeper, legalist. Uh, and then the second half of his life, he's uh, had this revelation of the harm that he's done to God and the church and to Jesus. And he's incredibly regretful uh, and sorrowful for that. He feels a lot of shame and guilt for what he did. Uh, and he recognizes that he can't undo the damage, uh, but at the same time is grateful for God's uh, allowing him a second chance. And so uh, in Acts chapter th uh, 23, verse 6, we find that Paul was a Pharisee, but that he was also born into that. His dad was also a Pharisee. Uh, in Romans 9 and in uh, Romans 22, or in Acts 9 and in Acts 22, uh, Paul is talking about his former life and the mindset. Uh, and he, uh, he said that he was zealous, uh, uh, as big a, zealous, a, a zealot as there ever was. He was intent, focused, uh, dogmatic about the law and about keeping it. Uh, and he felt like it was his obligation to hunt down this new group of folks called Christians or people of the way, as it was known at that time, uh, and uh, turn them over to the Jewish authorities so that they could uh, be uh, put down. Uh, Paul says that his life, the first half of his life, was kind of like the older brother uh, on steroids. Um, he was thoroughly trained to do what he did, uh, and he valued those older brother values of trust and loyalty, integrity, hard work, fair play. And that was Paul. Until, as we, we find in um, uh, the, the book of Acts, the story of Paul's conversion. And uh, Paul is on the way to Damascus. He has this encounter with the risen Christ. <clears throat> and, uh, and Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And then uh, after a series of events, Paul begins to see and understand what God has been up to uh, for all these generations, Old and New Testament, uh, and how Christ is the central character of that, and how much damage Paul has done uh, to the church and to people because he wasn't open to a new idea and a new thought. And so he describes this feeling, uh, the, these emotions that he has uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39, when he says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, that's Paul's testimony. Uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? You'll see that Paul uses this language of a trial and bringing people to justice, which is what he did in his former life. Uh, and now he's uh, using it to talk about the freedom that he enjoys and has experienced and, and understands God better now. Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding uh, for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels or demons, neither present or future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a, that's a powerful statement for Paul. Uh, because he's talking about how he was separated from God. And there wasn't anything that he could do and there wasn't any distance he could run to or, that God couldn't still find him uh, and offer this grace to Paul. 
And so in Timothy, uh, Paul continues to talk about his new life and he says, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy. For Paul, that's amazing that that has happened, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out over me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So Paul has experienced both lives. He's experienced life as the older brother and life as the younger brother. Uh, and in uh, Romans uh, chapters 1 through 3, he paints a picture that the Gentiles in chapters 1 and 2 are a lot like the older, uh, a, a lot like the, the younger brother. Uh, brother. They are awful, terrible, no good, very bad. They, they do destructive things. They could care less what anybody thinks. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and so you have these two character types in the world today, not just Gentiles, but in every family you have older brother types and younger brother types. Uh, and in every church, in, in society, in every place we find ourselves, we find these characteristics of people. Uh, and so it, the goal is not to uh, take those characteristics away. The goal all through the Bible, as we see people working with other people, having to get along with other people, uh, that they are personality types that God has built into society, into the human race, and we've got to figure out a way to get along, which is a, a lot of what Paul is writing about uh, and trying to understand. And so the uh, younger brother is depicted by the Gentiles, but in chapter 2 and 3 of Romans, uh, you find that the, uh, the, the Jews, the law-keeping Jewish Christians, are depicted as the older brother. They're law keepers, they're doing all the right things, but they don't have uh, any sort of grace or love uh, in their hearts. And so then Paul in chapter 3 of Romans verse 10 drops this bomb that exposes everybody uh, when he says, no one is righteous, not even one. And so when Paul says that, there has to be a way now to reconstruct a uh, Christian community uh, where people can find grace and forgiveness. Uh, if both models are flawed, uh, then what's the way forward? And, and so again, I think that that's what Paul is doing in the back of his mind uh, in, in Romans 1 through 8 and really through a lot of Paul's writings and letters. Uh, and it's driven by two things. One, the the story of the prodigal son would have been the most recognized story in the early Christian community, and Paul would have been super familiar with it. But then Paul has also lived the life of the older brother and the younger brother, and then Paul sees in the church the destructiveness of the older brother and the younger brother. And so, uh, here in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking about the, the heart and the lament uh, of the younger brother. Uh, the younger brother values spontaneity, exploration, taking risks and chances, ready for adventure. Uh, but sometimes those characteristics or values get folks in trouble. Uh, they run off maybe before they should. They don't think before they act. And in this case of the prodigal son and also in Paul's history, uh, those, act those values got them in trouble. They didn't want to do the wrong thing. They didn't want to hurt their family. They didn't want to make a mess of things, uh, but they did. And so uh, as Paul is writing and lamenting and asking for forgiveness and telling his story, the younger son also comes back to the father. He recognizes he's in a dreadful place. Uh, and uh, living as, with his father, even as a servant, he recognizes that his dad is a, a, a very compassionate, caring uh, man, and he would rather live as a servant to his dad than a servant to some other person who is awful. Uh, 
And, and it's in this situation that we find these two extremes. One, the older brother, the law keeper, the rule keeper, which is a lot of people in our society, uh, is angry that the younger son is allowed to come back and that the dad welcomes him and celebrates him uh, and throws a party for him. Dad, how could you do that? He squandered everything. He's embarrassed our family. And as upset as the older son is, the younger son is just as flabbergasted by the grace uh, that's offered to him. When he comes home, when he just makes the decision to come home, he's not expecting anybody to pat him on the back or to embrace him in, in love. Uh, he's simply going to come back and beg for an opportunity just to be a servant. Uh, but the dad just uh, goes over the top, runs to him, puts on a, a coat, a rings on his fingers, uh, offers to have a, a meal and a celebration. And the dad is so excited that the son, uh, his family, uh, someone he loves, has returned home. And so uh, th these two extremes uh, exist in, in our life as, as well. Uh, but those extremes and the personalities behind them often cause conflict. And so as, as Paul is writing, if you flip over uh, after Romans to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you find that, that Paul is almost exasperated with the church. Uh, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, folks are fighting about everything. They're fighting about what to eat, what to wear, uh, what marriage ought to look like. They're fighting about uh, preferences they have. Uh, and, and in every situation, you have somebody who says, well, this is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, this is the tradition. This is the rule. This is how we're supposed to act. And then on the other side, you have somebody who says, well, yeah, but I don't really care about that. I want to I do something different. I want to experiment. I want to try something. Can't we be a little spontaneous? And so uh, all through First and Second Corinthians, you have this clash of older brother type values with younger brother uh, type values. Uh, and, uh, and, and Paul is trying to add his two cents about what they might do to mitigate that. And, uh, and then that rolls over into Ephesians and Philippians where Paul is bringing new values to all of us that, that are around unity and grace and love and service. And he does that because Paul is recognizing from his own life and from the story of the prodigal son uh, and the history uh, in the Old and New Testament that God has put us together, this uh, interesting mix of ideas and thoughts and personality types. And for the benefit of society and family and the church and even ourselves, we have to find a way uh, to, to work together. Now, he, Paul's never going to say that we have to give up our values, who we are, who we're created to be. He's, he's simply asking us to recognize that we're not the only personality type in the room. So how do we maintain the integrity of who we are, but also recognize that God has placed us in community and that we have to work it out? And so how can the older brother continue to, to live out trust and loyalty, integrity, hard work, and fair play, and the younger brother be free uh, to be spontaneous, innovate, fly by the seat of their pants sometimes? Um, and so Paul, I think, uh, again, as he's writing and he's recognizing uh, the, the task, the enormous task of bringing these two groups forward, he has a word for the older son and a word for the younger son. Um, and the word for the older son, I think, is found in Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved. And Paul is driving home this idea that it's by grace that we're saved and not by works, not by the law, not by adherence to the law, not by being the good older brother. As much as that's a value and that's great and that's wonderful, and Paul didn't want to take away from that, that we're not saved by our actions, we're saved by the grace of God. And if we're saved by the grace of God, then the others are saved by that same grace. And so our job is not to make everybody follow the dotted line, 
uh, but to look upon other folks uh, and see their value and the grace of God living in them. Um, and then to the younger brother, Paul says to him in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do, God did by sending his own son. And that's why you see so much language in Romans chapter 7 about uh, this thing I want to do, and if I don't do it, I'm compelled by a law of sin. Uh, because what happens with most younger brothers uh, uh, and, uh, or younger sisters is they, they, when they mess up, when they do something that hurts somebody, uh, or when they've done something to hurt themselves or go astray, there's a shame spiral. Uh, that can get out of control. We begin to believe that we're a failure. We begin to believe that we're no good, that uh, we're not as valuable as the older brother. We haven't uh, acted the same, done the same. We're, uh, we're not as good. We're not as valuable. Uh, there's something wrong. There's a defect. Uh, all of those things. And so Paul's words are there is there now for no condemnation because the law couldn't fix that, but God's grace can. The younger son isn't interested in the finer points of the law because the younger son's always looking for loopholes. Uh, no one has to tell the younger son that he messed up. He does that himself. He's his own worst critic. Um, maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe that's who you are and that's what you're feeling. Uh, this uh, belief that somehow uh, you have defective parts or uh, character. But it's a huge turn for Paul to say to folks in his church and in his day and also to you and me that God has created us in both of these personality types. And part of the way of working together is recognizing, first of all, that there are two, at least two different types. And the goal is not to just give up who we are and become some uh, bland vanilla um, extract, but that God values who we are, that what we're created to be. And the challenge for the church today and always has been how do we recognize those gifts in each other and work for the common good of the church and of God living out our faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for your work in our lives and our hearts, for how you've created us to be. Sometimes we always want to be different. If we have curly hair, we want straight hair. If, we have, um, if we're tall, we want to be short. If we're short, we want to be tall. We're, we always see things in others that we wish we had in ourselves. But help us not only to value who you've created us to be, but to live into that, to celebrate the good points of that, but also to recognize that's true about everyone around us. Uh, their finer points, their good points, and find ways to get along and, and uh, be respectful. Guide us, God, as your church and as your people. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. 
Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.